Morning, Refuse Church. Morning. I'm hot. It's not hot outside. We're going to be in John chapter 18, starting verse 33. Today's scripture reading. Where it says, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this from your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, You are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I have been born." And for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for everything you do for us. God, we thank you for the breath of life that you give us. We thank you for being born into this world. God, especially around these holiday times, around Thanksgiving, God, we thank you so much for everything you do for us. God, we thank you so much for Brother Steve. I pray that you just be with him today, be with his words. Lord, that wouldn't be his words, but it'd be yours speaking for you. God, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. She grew up in Burleson, Texas, a suburb of Fort Worth. Her parents divorced when she was six years old, and her mother raised her from that time on. She attended Southern Baptist Church as a child. At age 13, one day as she was singing down the hallways of her middle school, the choir teacher heard her singing and said, you need to audition for our musical. From that point on, she joined and auditioned for just about every musical in her high school and was a singer and actor. She was given many scholarships to go to different schools because of her singing ability and her acting ability, but she decided she was going to take another route. Instead of going to college, she moved to Los Angeles for a purpose of starting a career in music. She did multiple demonstrations, demos, records, and she was rejected many different contracts. No recording contracts for her. While she was in Los Angeles, the final straw for her, trying to get her career off to start, was when her apartment she was living in was destroyed by a fire. She moved back home to Texas. Shortly after she moved back home to Texas, her best friend told her, there's this new TV show that's coming out, and you ought to try out for it. She thought, there's just no way I could go up against 10,000 people and win such a contest like this. But she decided to enter for the first American Idol talent search, among many other hopefuls. She soon became a fan favorite, and on September 4th, 2002, Kelly Clarkson was named the winner of American Idol. Now, just like many people, if you've watched any of those shows, a lot of times American Idol, whenever there is someone who comes to the very end and they have their final song, it's a song that, hey, this is going to be your first single to come out. Quite often, they'll try to make it a song that can grab the attention of many people. But yet it would be maybe a love song, and yet at the same time, maybe more song about how this person, this contestant, went from nothing to a something. Or maybe a song on how they found their purpose, or maybe a song that said, I was born for this. Well, the song or the debut single that was chosen for Kelly Clarkson was a song called A Moment Like This. It topped the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 chart and became the country's best-selling single of 2002. A few of the words from her song, A Moment Like This, is this. Oh, I can't believe it's happening to me. Some people wait a lifetime for a moment like this. 
Since then, many of you who follow pop stars and that type of music, you know Kelly Clarkson has sold over 25 million albums, 40 million singles worldwide. She's had 27 songs on the Billboard Hot 100 chart, three number one songs and 11 in the top 10. She's won three Grammy Awards, four American Music Awards, two Academy of Country Music Awards. She is also the first artist in history to top each of the Billboard's pop, adult contemporary, adult pop, country, and dance charts. And she currently is a coach on the competition series The Voice and now hosts her own variety talk show, The Kelly Clarkson Show. Many of you who maybe watch those type of shows and see where they come out and have that final song and usually in that final song, whenever they win it, they can't make it through the song. And as she's singing that song, a moment like this, you can feel the joy. And many of us, as we watched it, we felt that same joy as, yes, she was born for this. It was a moment like this that she was born for. I don't know about you, but... I believe many of us in our lifetimes, we search for that type of meaning in life. We search for a purpose in life. In our opening scripture, we have Jesus Christ saying, this is the purpose that I came for. This is my purpose. And that's what we want to look at this month, is the idea of being born for a moment like this. Jesus was born for this, but I don't want you to miss this. We were also born for many of the same things. God didn't just send Jesus, and Jesus <laughs> left this earth. He left with a message, and Jesus left us the opportunity to pass on that same message to other people. So a lot of the same purposes that Jesus Christ had on earth, we have those same purposes. But quite often what happens, things get in the way. At first, for Kelly Clarkson, it was things like a divorce and her thinking, I can't make it because I have these bad things that happened in my life. Her moving to Los Angeles and falling upon hard times and then the fire. Finally, she gets her break, but it had to go through her mind many times that I'm not going to make it. I believe that I was created and given this opportunity to share with my voice that I may not have that opportunity. She could have given up. For many of us, there could be many things that make us give up on that opportunity of our purpose. And of course, Satan tried to stop Jesus Christ when it came to his purpose for coming here on earth. Things try to get in the way of our purposes. Let's look at a scripture that talks about Jesus. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. This idea of Jesus being born and the purpose. What was it that was trying to get in the way of Jesus' mission or his purpose? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, to you, you may just be thinking, you know, he was born to be our king. You've got to understand what's going on here among the Jewish people. They weren't looking for a king of their life. They were actually looking for someone who would set up and rule and make them the number one people, the number one nation. They wanted a Jewish leader. They wanted a warrior king, someone who could stand up for them and defend them and make them number one. They wanted to think that we have it all together. We are the number one nation and no one else matters. Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. Why? Herod was king. He don't want there to be another ruler here on earth, another king that might take his place. He was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. I want you to notice that I believe one of the main things that came against <coughs> Jesus and his purpose is what other people expected of him. What did the Jews expect of him? They expect him to be a real king. Whenever Jesus Christ the Messiah was born in a manger among farm animals, they thought this could not be the king. 
There's no way. We expected a king to come with a crown. A king that is, you know, in majesty in a robe. We expected a certain thing. A little baby born in a manger is not what we're looking for. It's not what we expected. They had different expectations for the purpose of the Messiah or the king who is going to be born. It was what others expected him to be that could have what? Messed things up. But Jesus knew what he had come for. And it wasn't for this. The first thing in your notes is this. Domination. He was not born for this. What they wanted was a king that would dominate. A king that would make tough decisions. A king that would come and say, I'm the ruler, follow me. A king that would say, these people are my people. This nation is my nation. And do not come against it. We are number one and anyone else will be defeated. They were expecting a king of do uh, domination. A king that would be a controller. You see, the Jews were acquainted with many of the prophecies about the Messiah. They knew that he was going to be the anointed one. But when they thought anointed one, they thought of a ruler, king, a warrior. They expected him to be a strong and earthly ruling king that would deliver them from what? The Roman oppressors. They wanted the Romans to move out of the way and allow their king to take control. They wanted to be a great and independent Jewish kingdom. And what we just read here is the wise men came and did what? The wise men came in Matthew 2, verses 1 through 2, and said, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? They wanted him to restore the kingdom of Israel. It was all about them. It was focused on them and them alone. They wanted domination. He chose instead, though, to wrap himself in swaddling clothes. He decided to wrap himself in humility, in weakness, and in humanity in order that we could be saved. And one of the main things that he told them was this. Next thing in your notes. His kingdom was not of this world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. I've not come to rule and set up myself as a king here. I come from a different place in a different world. It's my kingdom. It's not your kingdom. It's not a kingdom of domination. It's a kingdom that has a different purpose. And it's not only do we need to be realized or realize that his kingdom was not of this world. We need to realize ours is not of this world either. Don't miss this. In order to understand our purpose on earth, you've got to understand Jesus' purpose. And you've got to understand what it was not. Jesus' purpose was not to dominate and be in control. And neither is ours supposed to be domination and control of our own life here on earth. This is the way I want it. This is the what I want out of life. We, were, we are not of this world, the Bible says. We are to serve Him as our King. And it's supposed to be about His kingdom. That's what we're supposed to be living for. The Bible tells us we're not supposed to live for the things of the world. It's not supposed to be about riches. It's not supposed to be about fame. It's not supposed to be about what we can gather for ourselves. And so that we can have our fame. And so that we can dominate. We've got to understand, just like Jesus, we are not of this kingdom. Our kingdom is the kingdom of heaven. And we serve Him. He is our king. If you've never done that before, I pray that maybe today would be the day of your salvation. Because that's what the baby Jesus came for. He came for you to understand it's not supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be about loving Him and loving others. That's our purpose here on earth. And in order to do that, we've got to realize we can't set ourselves up as king. There has to come a time in our lives where we reject that. And we say, I am not going to be king of my life. I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to make Jesus Christ my king. I'm going to trust him as my savior. I'm going to allow him to become my lord and my king of my life. And I'm going to follow him the best that I can. And I'm going to find my purpose in him. Not my purpose in controlling my own life. You see, we try to control our own lives to find peace. We try to control our own lives in order to find happiness. We try to control our own lives in order to find joy. We try to control everything that happens in our life. 
But life doesn't work that way. A lot of times life is out of control. And those of us who are believers, we understand that we're not of this world. We're not of this kingdom. That if we follow Him and His kingdom, we can put that trust in Him. We can hope in Him. We can find joy in Him. And that gives us purpose for our life. Our purpose isn't domination and becoming something of ourselves. Our purpose is falling in love with God and falling in love with other people. And when we realize that, we realize the things that Jesus came for are the same things that he begs us to do the same in our lives. What mattered to him ought to be the things that matter to us. He was not of this kingdom. His kingdom was not of this world, nor is ours. In our opening scripture today, there was an interesting exchange between Pilate and Jesus. Now notice that we jump from the birth of Jesus to the death of Jesus because you've got to understand to completely realize the purpose of someone's life. When someone comes to the end of their life, you realize, wow, look what they did. Look what they're leaving behind. And sometimes, even if we don't want to think about it, we've got to think about the end of our lives and what are we going to be known for. If we were to die today, would we be known for living a life like Jesus? Or a life of domination and control where we didn't think about others. We only saw our own fame and our own good and our own riches. And those things that the Bible says we can't take with us to heaven. We're supposed to build for ourselves up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Do, do we realize that? Do we understand what that's all about? And so what do we have here? Jesus is going to be speaking to Pilate here towards the end of his life. And Jesus is going to speak and act in a way that reveals his true mission or his purpose. Now you may wonder, how did you come about with this sermon series? Well, I don't remember how long ago, maybe three, four months ago, but Pastor Dylan got up here and preached one day. And from the version of the Bible that he was using, he quoted this scripture. And whenever he quoted the scripture and Jesus said in this translation, this is my purpose, it read a little bit differently. In the version he read it from, it said, Jesus said, I was born for this. As soon as he used that scripture, I wrote it down and I said, that's going to be our sermon series for December. Jesus saying, I was born for this. This is my purpose. This is what I was born for. You know what a great motivation is? When you figure out in life what you're born for, what your purpose is. And what I'm telling you, Christian, is it's not hard to figure out if you're a follower of Jesus because you were born to be like Jesus. We were born to be little Jesuses here on earth. We were born to be a light just like he was a light. And there's many things that Jesus did. Listen to what the scripture says. John 18, 36 and 37. My kingdom does not have its origin here, Jesus said. You are a king then, Pilate asked. So he's coming back to his own ideas of what a king should be. You're here to dominate. You're here to be an earthly king. You say that I am a king, Jesus replied. But what? I was born for this. What's he talking about? He's about to die on the cross. He's about to give his life for us. He's about to bring salvation. He's about to bring mediation. He's about to bring restoration. He's about to bring joy. He's about to bring hope. He's about to bring peace. Don't miss that. He said, I was born for this. And I have come to the world for this. To testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. You've heard me say it over and over again. And I know I get excited about this. But I believe we sell the Bible short. And we sell our lives short. Whenever we give in to a Christianity that's all about just saying a prayer to get to heaven. When Jesus Christ offers us so much more. It's so much more than a prayer for an eternal life in heaven. It's a prayer saying, God, not only do I want that free home in heaven, but I reject myself as king. I choose you as king. I set you up as king, and now I find a purpose. I am understanding that my purpose is what? Not just getting to heaven. 
My purpose is the same as you, to bring joy, hope, peace, love, restoration to a broken world. I was born for this. I don't know about you, but that excites me. And you don't have to be a pastor to understand this. doesn't mean everyone was called to be a preacher behind a pulpit. But yet you were called to preach the good news. You were called to tell other people about Jesus Christ. You were called to bring restoration and hope and joy and peace to the lives of other people. Because when you find that in Christ, then you can pass it on to other people. And you're part of that same mission. He was born for this I was born for this. Jesus was born for this. You were born for this. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to look at these things that Jesus said, I was born for this. What were those things that he was born to do? So we learned that domination, that he was not born for this. It, what others expected him to be, what others expect you to be, you can ignore that because you have a higher calling. What is part of that higher calling? What is the part we're looking at today? He was born to restore. It wasn't domination, but restoration. Restoration. Christ was born for this, and we were born for this. Now, many of you understand what restoration is. If you restore something in an old house, whether it be a piece of furniture or whether it be the house itself, you know what restoring is. If you understand what restoring is, you may think of a car or a vehicle where you find an old car and you bring it back to close to what it was before. I want you to understand something. Whenever the Bible talks about the restoration that God gives, the restoration that Jesus Christ brought to us because he was born for this purpose, that this restoration goes even farther. The biblical definition, definition for restoration is not just bringing back or putting something back to a former or original state. The word that's used here isn't just trying to make it look like what it used to be. The Bible says that whenever Jesus Christ comes to our life, he doesn't just want to restore what we could have been, that sin took away from us, that Satan took away from us. But when it comes to restoration, the main point is that someone or something is improved beyond measure. Don't miss that. It's not just brought back to what it used to be. It's improved beyond measure. We made it better than it ever was supposed to be. You know what the Bible is saying? That whenever you accept Jesus as your Savior and you allow him to be your king, he doesn't just promise you a new life. He promises you that you're going to be a new creation in heaven and that you can have a better life on earth. Better and improved beyond the original model. Why? Because it's not you trying to dominate. It's Jesus Christ living in you and through you. He said you can find purpose through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus offers restoration. You know what he tells us? He said, I was born for this. I was born to restore you. You think your life is messed up? I can make it better. In fact, I can take it beyond what you can ask or think. I can make it be something that you never thought your life could be. I can mend it. I can help it. I can restore it. Not just back to the original, but improve beyond measure. He works constantly to save and restore creation so deeply wounded by sin. This was prophesied. This was meant to be. Jesus Christ was born for this purpose. Look at Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 16 through 22. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, this is talking about Jesus, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now when he stands up to read here, what is he going to talk about? He's going to be talking about how his purpose, quoted back in the book of Isaiah, He's going to quote those scrolls and say, it was prophesied, it was said that one day I would come, I would be the Messiah, and that this was going to be my purpose. And my purpose completely covers all these things, and they all have to do with restoration. They all have to do with making that which has been lost saved. 
bringing that which was messed up and bringing it to something better or beyond. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up as was his custom. He went to the synagogues on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unscrolled the scroll and found the place, so it was specific what he wanted to say, found the place where it was written, written, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to do what? <coughs> proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Why is that all he did? Man, that's a whole sermon in itself. You're going to find out in a minute. He's like, enough said right there. This is my purpose. This is what I came for. It was said and prophesied in Isaiah, and I was born for this. I was born to bring restoration, not to denominate, but to dominate, but to restore. He said, today the scripture is uh, fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Do you understand what's going on here? He let them know that he was born to restore. And we have that same purpose. You know, in John chapter 20, verse 21, Jesus met his disciples. And by the way, the Bible says if we're followers of him, we are also disciples. He met his disciples after the resurrection, just before he returned to heaven. And he said this, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. I love it when I heard a pastor say something along this line. I was listening one day to a preacher and he said, you know what? Jesus, he was God. Whenever he left, he could have left the monument that we could all go visit. He could have left the museum that we could have all went to. But Jesus, all the things that he could have left to say, this represents me and follow me. He chose what to leave behind. He chose me. He chose you. He said, you're exactly what I want to represent. Me. I don't need no museum. I need you to walk around on this earth realizing your purpose has the same purpose. And you touching the lives of other people. You being a light in the dark world just like I was a light in the dark world. As the Father sent me, so send I you. One pastor said this, disciples of Jesus are an extension of Jesus' mission of the world. He is the light of the world and we are little beings or little reflections of him. You know, I had already written this down in my message, this idea of us being little beings, this idea of being light in a world of darkness. Whenever I decided with my wife the other night, I think she chose to watch it, but anyone happen to give in and do the Disney Plus thing or steal someone else's Disney Plus? Well, they have a Christmas movie on there. At first, I was like, I don't think I'll like this movie, but she put it on, I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. It's called Noel, okay? We decided to watch it. I actually ended up loving the movie quite a bit. But towards the end, this whole idea, I won't steal the movie for you, okay? The whole idea comes to Santa Claus needs a replacement, and Noel is his daughter, and his son isn't working out as the Santa, and so is it possible that his daughter could step in and be the Santa? And at one point, one of the head elves, I think it was her nanny elf, looks at her, and says this. And whenever they said it, I was like, man, that goes with my sermon. My kids hate that, by the way. Like growing up with a pastor, but I say they hate it, but then they started doing it. Quite often we go to movies and say, Dad, this is preach. Did you see this? I think you can use this as an illustration. She looks at Noel and she makes this comment. She says, saying that Santa is in her, this girl has the twinkle, is what she says. This girl has the twinkle. And I was like, that's my sermon. That's my sermon. We have the same purpose. <coughs> and each and every one of you is a bit of Jesus, a bit of God. He's asked us to go into the world and bring restoration, joy, hope, and peace. Whenever Jesus looks at you, he says, I see a twinkle. There's a twinkle in that eye. If you are serving me and doing your purposes, you can be a light in this world to other people. 
Well, what was this like? What was it that he did? He goes through a whole list of things. I'm going to cover this for a minute. Because if you don't completely understand restoration of what he gives to you and what you have to offer the world through him, let's talk about those for a minute. Some of them you may slightly misunderstand. One of them is this. He said, I come to bring good news to the poor. Good news to the poor. Now, to understand what he's talking about, you've got to understand the word poor here. Usually when we think poor, we think without money. But the word that is being used here on bringing good news to the poor, the word poor is translated with the words to crouch, to cringe, to cower down, to hide oneself in fear. It's a picture of one crouching and cowering like a beggar with a tin cup to receive the pennies that are dropped in. It's talking about our spiritual poverty, how we don't deserve heaven, and how like a beggar we're hoping that somehow we can find salvation. And Jesus says, I've come to bring good news to you who says, I'm not good enough to go to heaven. Nor could I ever be good enough to go to heaven. Where you feel like, God, I keep letting you down. How could I go to heaven? And you cringe and you cower. And he says, it's not you that you're trusting in. You trust in me. You get salvation through me. I give you good news of great joy. I was born for this. I was born so that you could have salvation. Good news to those of you who lack spiritually, who just don't measure up. He said, that's what I bring to you. You know, all around you. I know there's a few people you meet every day that says, I'm all that, and I've got it all together, and I'm perfect. You know, you're probably married to them. Hmm. Just kidding. You know, whenever you go in your workplace, whenever you go in your workplace, there may be a few of those who feel like I've got it all together, but most people probably cringe and cower and think, yeah, I messed up. I've tried this thing on my own. I am a sinner. I am messed up. And that's a good place to be. Because Jesus says, I offer good news for you. And not only did he bring good news to those who are spiritually poor, that's our job too. That's part of your purpose. Each and every day when you cross the paths of people who feel like I'm not good enough to go to heaven, you can agree with them and say, no, neither am I, but I've got good news. That's what Jesus was born for. He died for our sins so that we can go to heaven. You have the purpose, just like he did. It comes through Jesus Christ to offer good news to the poor. Now, this whole idea of the spiritual poverty and this idea of crouching and cringing and cowering down, I don't want you to miss those powerful words when it talks about being spiritually poor. Because when Jesus says, I bring you good news, you know what he's saying? He's saying, with salvation, you don't have to cringe or cower anymore. I bring you restoration, which means what? You can stand up straight. You can stand tall. Not in the goodness that you did, but in the salvation that I bring you through my blood. You can stand tall and you can have assurance of your salvation and know it's through Jesus Christ that we receive salvation. It's good news to the poor. It doesn't stop there. He says, not only did I come to restore in that way, but I came to bring healing for the brokenhearted. That word brokenhearted means a wounded spirit. Anyone brokenhearted out here? Anyone have a wounded spirit? Some days you just don't know how you're going to get through a day because things aren't going well, bills aren't getting paid, you miss someone that you dearly love. Are there any wounded spirits out there? Jesus said, for this purpose I came. I came to bring healing for the brokenhearted. I understand that there's wounded spirits. And listen, he said, I want to bring you restoration. What do you think, sir, or not? He said, I can make things better. He's saying, I don't just want to give you a bandage to cover up temporarily. He said, I want to bring you healing. Healing. For those who are broken hearted. Do you see the brokenness around you each and every day? Do you see people right now who are struggling with maybe not coming up with food? People are wondering, how am I going to put toys underneath the tree? 
People who are struggling through the holidays because of brokenness in their own lives and missing a loved one and they're hurting and going through pain. Jesus says one of the things that can help you out even in your own pain is realizing part of your purpose is to bring joy and hope and restoration to the other wounded spirits out there. Have you ever done that before? I have. You have a bad day. And instead of just saying, I hope someone comes and cheers me up, you decide to do something good for someone else, and you walk away feeling so good about it. Why? What is that? Because you were born for this. You were born for the same purpose. You were born to bring healing to the brokenhearted. No wonder you're feeling joy because you're finding your purpose. Jesus said, I came to bring good news to the poor. I came to bring healing for the brokenhearted. Next, he said, I bring liberty for the captives. Now, don't miss this part. This idea of captive here, the actual words used means at spear point. A soul or uh, that is in moral or spiritual bondage. This idea of being at spear point means you are a prisoner of war. And the Bible says those of you who feel like your soul is held captive or you're in a spiritual bondage, you're a prisoner of war, he says, I want to bring liberty for you if you feel like you're being held captive. That you are, your soul just isn't what it should be. He said, I want to bring you a restoration beyond measure. I want to bring liberty that goes beyond the war that you're going through in your heart and in your soul. Then he goes on and says, I want to bring sight to the blind. I want to bring sight to the blind. You see, sin blinds us and the Messiah comes to heal our spiritual and moral blindness. Restoration. This idea of recovering one's sight. There are many around us who are blinded by this world. They're blinded by the things of the world and they don't see the joy and the peace and the restoration. Jesus says, I came to bring them sight and you have the opportunity to go around and do what? Bring these people sight. Help them realize their purpose on this earth, not just your own purpose. And then he says, I came to bring freedom for the oppressed. What does it mean by oppressed? Those who are actively being crushed, bruised, taken advantage of, or are victims of violence. This is very specific. The Bible says there are some people on this earth who are in a relationship or have someone in their lives where they feel like they can never do right. They are feeling crushed by these people. They feel bruised and hurt by these people. It may be physical abuse. It may be emotional abuse. Whatever the abuse is, they feel oppressed or held down, crushed, bruised, taken advantage of, victim of violence. I want you to understand that Jesus is not just proclaiming freedom for the oppressed. He is actively setting people free from their oppressors. He says, I want to free you from your oppressors. And it just doesn't mean people. Think of those things that crush you and bruise you and take advantage of you like grief. Does grief get a hold of you and crush you and make you feel like a victim and taking advantage of you? What about worry? What about fear? Jesus says, I came to bring you freedom so that you no longer have to be oppressed. And again, in order for us to bring them Jesus, we got to get him first. So you've got to ask yourself, am I following Jesus? Is he my king? Have I asked him for salvation, for heaven and an abundant life here on earth? Am I following him? If you are, then as God gives you that joy and that peace and that love and restoration, he said, now you get to do that with me. You get to bring sight to the blind, good news to the poor, healing to the brokenhearted, freedom to the oppressed. As the worship team comes up, I want you to realize and understand something here. His purpose, Jesus' purpose, was not to be king like they thought. It wasn't about himself. It wasn't about his power. It wasn't about his control. It wasn't about his comfort. It's not supposed to be about those things for us either. It's not supposed to be about ourself this life. That's supposed to be about our power, our fame, our control, our comfort. Our purpose is not to be king of our lives. Our purpose is not supposed to be about those things. But hopefully you can remember this. The last thing in your notes is this. What is it that we're supposed to do like Jesus? What is our purpose? It's living for a great cause 
not a great comfort. Don't miss that. It's living for a great cause, not a great comfort. He didn't promise us comfort. He promised us a call. He didn't promise us that everything would be okay. He said, I'll take everything that's messed up and make it beautiful. And I'll restore it and I'll make it better. And once I'm doing that in your life, you could bring that same joy, hope, love, and restoration to a broken world. What is the greater cause you are living for? Well, one of those things is restoration. He was born for this and we were born for this. As I close, I want to draw your attention to what I would say is our church's main mission. Our main mission that we've been talking about for about 17 months now here at Refuge Church is this. Whenever Jesus in his model prayer teaches us to pray, he says, thy kingdom come. It's not about the kingdom here on earth, but may Jesus' kingdom come. And your will, Jesus, be done. Where? Here on earth as it is in heaven. Our motto, our mission, our theme, whatever you want to call it, is to resonate a little bit of heaven here on earth. That's our job, to resonate a little bit of heaven here on earth. Jesus says, I was born for this. How about you? you realize his purpose. As you go out today, tomorrow, in the workplace, in the shopping center, the people who cross your way, you realize that you can be a light for Jesus, that you can bring restoration, hope, and joy to this world. Jesus was born for this. We were born for this. What's incredible is by his grace, he looks at every single one of you who are born again, and he says, see the twinkle. In twinkle. I'll let other people see you. Let's pray. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would challenge our hearts, God, that you would allow us to understand the purpose that you were brought here for. And God, that you not only want to change our lives, but God, you want to change the lives of those around us. And you chose us, God. You chose us to be a little glimpse of you and bring a little bit of heaven here on earth. Help us rise to that challenge. As you stand this morning, everybody standing together, what is God doing in your heart? What does he have for you this morning? You need to come talk to myself or Pastor Dill or someone this morning and say, hey, I need to give my life to Jesus. I'm not sure he's my Lord. I'm not sure he's my Savior. May today be the day of your salvation. Maybe you know he's your Savior, but you've lost a glimpse of your purpose and what you were born for. You need to bring more restoration into your home, more restoration into your marriage, more restoration into your workplace, more restoration into your neighborhood. Ask him how you can be that glimmer of light where he has you. Allow him to challenge you today. He was born for this. We were born for this.